Hi, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Tom McBride. I've uh, been a lecturer here at the University of Technology in Sydney for oh, about ten, 10 years, just a little bit over. And like so many uh, lecturers, academics, I struggle with the problem of how do I get students to engage in the subjects that I'm trying to teach. Now we know that students learn better and people learn better the more that they can, can engage with the subject. Uh, but so many students, um, they, they turn up to lectures, they listen to the lectures, they might read, read uh, some textbook or some recommended papers, but probably don't do that much more, uh, despite um, that we recommend they uh, do some of the exercises or try things out. It generally doesn't happen, and I've struggled with this for um, quite some time. But in the last uh, two or three years, I've gradually um, introduced and um, revised, improved, uh, peer reviews and they seem to work very well. So let me talk about those. The problem as I said is that students um, find it a little bit difficult to engage in the subject. It, it's new and it's different and it's, uh, it's a bit daunting for a start. As well, students now seem ever more to have more demands on their time and um, it, you know, faced with the choice between something that um, gives them some pleasure and something that makes them feel uncomfortable, as, as learning new things does, then they will just choose not to do the learning. However, when we look at all the information we get back from students about uh, what they enjoy about learning and teaching and um, in the subjects, a lot of them do point out that they really want to know some things. They, they really need to know what is it I'm supposed to be learning at all. Um, I mean, it can be obvious to the person teaching it that you really want to learn this or that or something else. But when you're new into a topic, th there seems to be a whole range of information. And what of that information should I really pay attention to now? So getting some accurate idea of what they're supposed to learn can be difficult. As well, uh, I think one of the major things that we get in surveys all the time is that students really want to know good feedback, a lot of it. Um, now, if you think in terms of learning almost anything else, for example, uh, learning how to drive a car, the car gives you feedback all the time and you can adjust what you're doing depending on the feedback. But when you're coming to learning, unless you're actually doing some practical examples for which there is a clear answer, and you know, one where you can tell whether it's right or wrong, it's very difficult to get that feedback. Now, in some of the subjects I teach, there isn't really a right answer. I mean, I teach things like quality management and uh, software architecture, uh, process type things, and there isn't, there isn't a right answer. Uh, there are lots of answers, and some answers work better than others. So how do the students know what is a good answer and what's a bad answer? And for, which, for this, they need a lot of feedback. They also want to know, how well am I doing? I mean, am I learning this? Am I uh, well behind what everybody else is doing? Or, or, you know, is it hopeless? Should I give up? Or am I, am I doing too much work? Am I just um, uh, blitzing the whole thing? So they need to know those things. And it can be difficult to, to get that to them. Now, the common response uh, that I've seen in, in so many uh, papers on teaching, uh, so many workshops that I've attended on teaching, um, and the, some of the things I've tried myself, is to try somehow to encourage class discussions. That's one response. Another one is uh, group assignments and group discussions. And uh, formative assessment of work in progress, and also summative assessment of work in progress. Now all of these have their problems. Um, class discussions, yes they're great, uh, if you happen to be talented enough that you can actually pick on a topic and you can somehow uh, encourage a, an engaging debate in which everybody engages. Um, most of us aren't that talented and most of our discussions fairly reasonably easily turn into uh, some semblance of a discussion that seems to be dominated by the extroverts and that leaves a lot of people, a lot of students, um, not participating and not getting much benefit out of it. They simply sit back and they don't get the benefit. Uh, group assignments and group discussions, um, same answer. 
um, how do you actually manage to encourage that discussion uh, when it's essentially the students don't want to discuss it? They they just want to you know do you know tell me what I have to do and then I can go home. Uh, that's one of the things. Formative assessment. Uh, yes, I agree. That's that's one thing that's uh, really good to do. The problem with that is the cost of doing it. If you want to do regular, uh, good, thorough formative assessment, then you're going to have to spend, or somebody is going to have to spend, maybe about a half an hour uh, on each, uh, each item of uh, assessment and get it back. Now that rapidly escalates into an unsustainable cost. So that's a bit of a problem. Now, this whole idea of peer critiques, I happen to work in the software uh, development industry and I teach software engineering type subjects. Um, in this domain, peer reviews is a very common um, practice uh, because one of the things that software engineers do understand is that it doesn't matter whether you think it's alright or not, um, what happens, what matters is does it actually work? and the embarrassment and the cost of getting it wrong can be quite severe. So uh, software engineers learn reasonably early in their careers that it really is better to have uh, your colleagues review your work and point out any problems before you release this out for the general public who will definitely find the problems and some of them can be very expensive. Now we're not the only industry that has peer critiques. I believe the design industry, uh, architecture, uh, they all have peer critiques as well and uh, this is just a standard practice and they, they try to address the same human problems of um, confirmation bias and um, overlooking things that are obvious and um, there's a whole lot of practice that they do. So. We know that independent review helps to uncover assumptions, uh, just straight up mistakes, um, bias as I said. Uh, independent review also is used a great deal in the industry uh, so that um, people who are new and don't quite know what to do or don't quite know the domain can learn from somebody who's very experienced. So you generally try to get a mix of reviewers uh, from the, the very experienced who, who really are very good at reviewing to the less experienced who both need to learn how to give a review and um, what to review. So what kind of things are you looking for? And the other thing is that independent review generally produces better work. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Now it happens that in my observation, the students are about as capable as I am of assessing someone's work. Uh, this was, you know, you could say, well, this is a fairly, um, damning finding if, if my students are about as good as I am at, at marking the work, but it's quite true. Um, now individually, any individual student possibly doesn't quite know as much as I do about the subject. I mean, after all, I've been teaching it for a few years and you do learn some things. However, uh, in any one group of people, there's likely to be somebody who really knows the topic and their review can be probably about as good as I could do in that review in those circumstances. For whatever reason, uh, as I say, my observation is that the feedback and the reviews that I can get from students are about as good as I could do. So collectively, students really are able to identify the good, the bad, and whatever needs improvement. So that's a pretty good outcome. Now I found though that peer reviews need structure. Now this is my observation both from industry where I was a quality manager uh, and from, from reviews in academia. If you simply set somebody the task of saying well, what's wrong with this, um, you get all sorts of feedback and um, all manner of results and quite often not very good. But if you turn it around and say does it have this property or is this property uh, present or has it got this fault? Has it done these things? If you ask specific questions, then people will do a much better review because they will answer those questions. Similarly, the industry generally found that if you give reviewers particular roles to play, so if, for example, if it's a software development uh, um, review, and then you could say, okay, 
Uh, this, this, can you play the role of the customer? Can you play the role of the user? Can you play the role of support? Can you play the role of, I don't know, the owner or something like that? And given those roles, people are better able to pick out specific problems. So the review criteria uh, that I use in these reviews, and I will show you some, um, are posed as uh, statements. Um, simply because the, the answer comes out as a Likert scale and a Likert scale works best if you, you make a statement and the reviewer can agree or disagree uh, on the scale. Now as well as that um, there is room for the comments and I'll, again I'll deal with that uh, soon. So here is an example of the review questions I, I have used for a review and this, this review is the one that's subject of the, the uh, videos you'll see later. And it, it's uh, a review of conceptual architecture and the, re the conceptual architecture should do a whole lot of things but there aren't too many questions uh, necessary to get at is this a good conceptual architecture and there are the example of those questions so uh, the students are faced with this and they have to answer this as reviewers all right now how do I motivate the students to participate in these reviews with, you know, with a certain amount of serious intent. Well, uh, students will do things for marks. Uh, now these reviews, it happens that I, I set them up so that there might be uh, five reviews in a term and all of those five reviews in total might carry um, 15 marks out of 100. So each review is worth about three marks. It's not that much. But it's enough. Students care about these marks and they care if they lose a half a mark here or a full mark there somewhere else. So paying them with marks works. They add up. Now, the way this works, that I've found works, is that the, the presenting group gets the mark that their reviewers give them. So they're given a mark out of five. Each each question is rated in a zero to five. How much, how well did they do this? And the mark is the average of all those. That's what the presenting group gets. But the reviewers must all submit a valid review. And valid, the rules for valid is pretty simple. It has to be present. So if you weren't there and you didn't submit a review, you don't get any marks. If you did submit a review, but it's meaningless, then you don't get any marks. And by meaningless, um, the ratings, you're encouraged to give any rating you wish. But each rating must be accompanied by an explanation of why you gave that rating. If there's no explanation, no marks. If the explanation doesn't match the, the, the rating, then again, no marks. And by doesn't match, I mean, if you've given a five, meaning excellent work, you better explain why is it excellent. And if you can't explain why it's excellent, no marks. So, how do I justify this? Well, I figure if you don't know enough to give a sensible review, then you don't know the subject well enough to get any marks for it. All right. The comments, um, the comments I gather through Google Forms. Now you could use any kind of survey uh, type you like. I mean, you probably use the same thing with SurveyMonkey or any, any form of uh, readily available survey. I haven't used Google Forms because it's easy, uh, it's free, and I get the results in a spreadsheet. Tonight we're going to be recording because I need to show other academics how to run peer reviews, and you've had practice last week, so this week should be pretty cool. Now, again, if anybody does not want to be on the final video, let me know, because we'll put some sticky tape across you front and back so that in the final cut when I'm editing, if I see that tape, then I just edit that piece out. So if anybody does not want to be in the final show, let me know. Okay. <laughs> now this week, we need to split, uh, change groups around so that you're reviewing different groups. So can I have you, you guys with that group? Yes. Thank you. Did you go with them last week? Right? You with them? Which groups are on? 
We were with them. Okay, we have two groups there. You're sorted. You two groups here. Organizing himself. In a sense, the carrot is in the sense of management and the power of the GPS and the patient and the patient. Right, so we'll move on to our normal scenario. And the next one, the last one is uh, the system and data store must be secure by encryption for security and privacy. We take the privacy of our patients very seriously and um, we won't share any of our data with the outside. Us. Then they release the assignment. The students are notified of the assignment. And what is going on here? Okay, and then they're allowed to basically submit any time before the due date. The subject coordinator is given the option to change the due due date for like individual students from this adventure or whatever. And that will give the um, The thing with these kind of diagrams is they do not show a proper image with the code or the programming at all. So when we're trying to go and think about this, you know, like programming for them, I guess, it's just harder to produce. Um, we don't have the physical connection of the system. Because it helped me understand each of the scenarios you initially addressed at the start of the presentation. So obviously, if I can like get my head around the whole thing a lot better, it's easier for me to understand your whole document. So I really thought the normal scenarios um, were beneficial for the uh, presentation. And the effects of all this. What's the outcomes? Well, I've never seen students quite so engaged in the subject. I've never seen them so animated in a class. I've never seen such a big turn up and participation. So, so far as teaching is concerned, it works magnificently. As well, uh, my observation of the comments that come back from the reviewers uh, are just terrific. Uh, they, they do show not all of them, but there's, there's enough in a collection of reviews uh, to give extremely good feedback and extremely good advice. I mean, the quality of feedback is really, really good. Now, I found this to be consistent across uh, all of the subjects I teach. Uh, so, uh, in terms of, uh, is it worthwhile? Yes, it is. It has some magnificent outcomes. <laughs>